All right, welcome back. This time, so we talked about current assets. Now we're talking about fixed assets and other assets. Okay, so we're still in the assets area, right? We talked about cash. We talked about receivables, and we talked about the bank. Okay. Now we're moving on to a new platform where we're gonna finally introduce you to what happens to these types of、um, depreciation, right? Fix dealing with fixed assets. Well, what is depreciation? Well, let's talk about what the definition is. Depreciation, right? Just taking a look at the word. You're adding value. In this case, it's D, right? D means you're taking away value, and that's the idea here. That when we buy fixed assets, especially when we buy fixed assets, we have the idea and the concept that, well, if the historical cost tells me that I have to record it at whatever I originally purchased it, and it cannot change value over time, we have to understand in reality that is not true. We use our machines. Of course, we know it's not going to stay or hold its value over time. So what we have to do is we have to take an initial an additional step to depreciate our fixed assets. Meaning, well, if we know I'm going to be using my asset. I have to find some kind of way to spread the cost evenly amongst its estimated useful life to determine to me what my book value is for every year that I use my asset for, because I have to also remember that we're living in tech. We're living in a technological tech,、uh, a world technology, right? We know that as we use our our machines, right, they start to have some wear and tear. And what happens when we get to that point where those assets can no longer work for us? Then we have to get rid of it, and then either purchase a new one or do some kind of way to either maintain maintain that fixed asset, and you know either change new parts to it or something to it, right? So that's the idea here. Is that well? In reality, my books may say that I have a machine that I purchased, but to me, because I'm using the machine, I have to know that it's definitely going to lose value over time, right? Especially the amount of times that I use it. So in this case, right, that's exactly what depreciation does, right? Depreciate means you're adding value, right? So if you ever heard of an appraisal, an appraisal appreciates, right? Where they add value or they they determine the value of your of whatever asset that you have. Depreciate is where you're going to calculate what it's going to、uh, be losing value. Okay. So a great example would be if I bought a printer. What happens when you open up the box? Right. Boom! It loses value. What happens if you plug it into the outlet? Boom! It loses value. What happens if you print out? It loses value. Why? Again, wear and tear is the idea. And then if you think that you can go ahead and return the product, yes, you can, depending on what the company system is. But usually, once you return that product back to the store, what happens? Can they sell it? That exact product for the same value as you purchased it from the store? No. No, because you used it. It has wear and tear. Okay. Oftentimes, it's, it could be refurbished. So what happens is they sell it at a lower price because it's been opened. It's been used. Okay. That doesn't mean it can't be sold because again, there's there's people out there who like to buy. Used items, but that's the idea, right? Same thing. If you buy a piece of furniture and you sat on it, you just whatever you did, right? And you decide to dispose it and put it back on the market, right? Do you think people are going to buy it at the price that you paid for it? No. 
No, because as soon as you start using your fixed assets, they tend to lose value over time due to wear and tear. So that's exactly what we're going to be introducing for today is that this only happens to tangible fixed assets. So as we talked about tangible means, right? Tangible, which is a key component of a fixed asset, right? If you remember what the, the fixed assets are, it's your PP&E. PP&E equals property, plant, or equipment. So property is going to be the land and anything that's on the land. So again, your street, your street, your sidewalks, your parking lot, your street lamps, okay? Your plant is going to be your building and every everything inside the building. So again, if you are having furniture inside your building, if you're going to have lamps inside your building, right? Desks, chairs, those are all going to be the building and everything that's inside the building, okay? And then you're going to have your equipment, which is going to be any type of machinery that helps you operate your business. So again, um, uh, so again, uh, excuse me, <coughs> a refrigerator, right? A microwave, any kind of electrical appliance is going to be considered your equipment, okay? So now that we established that depreciation is only dedicated for tangible fixed assets, we also have to know that tangible fixed assets do also have what's called a life. Okay, so we'll talk about that when we dive into the components of a fit of depreciation for a fixed asset. Okay, so here are some few examples of what those tangible fixed assets are. So again, computers, furniture, um, trucks, okay, including buildings, right? Now, here's one thing that you need to know. Land can never be depreciated. Okay, why? In this case, because we're learning accounting for the very first time, land is going to be not, it's going to be one of those items that you can't depreciate because as we go further in advanced accounting, you're going to learn that you're going to deplete your land, right? Because land has some kind of natural resource in it, right? It's got oil, it's got diamonds, it's got valuables in the soil, so in this case, when a land has value, right? And of course, when you have, um, you know, people who dig up those valuable resources out from the land, you're considered depleting the land, okay? So um, in this case, that's, that's, that's the terminology you need to know is that land will never be depreciated because it's going to be depleted. Now, again, the idea of depletion is the same as depreciation. It's just different terminologies for different types of assets. So in this case, that's why we're also going to learn, right? What's amortization? Okay, they right. They all do the same exact concept. The only difference is determining the different terminologies for each different item. So again, any tangible fixed asset is going to be depreciated. Land is depleted. Intangible assets are amortized. Right. Okay. Hey. When you land is depleted that means that it's kind of depreciated but it's de depreciated in a different way say like if um if you have land in the most uh ritziest of uh section of town that land would be more but if anything come out like gentrification or anything like that come about then that's when the land starts getting depleted correct so again, if uh, if the land becomes filled with land landfill, right? It starts getting uh -huh. trash in it. No one's going to want to live there. So yes, so in this case, so depletion again is another word for depreciation, except because it's land, you can't use depreciation. So again, these terminologies, they all do generally the same exact concept. The only difference is the way that you make an association. So again, fixed assets is depreciation, land is depletion, amortization is intangible assets. So that's how you have to understand it. But they all do the same thing. They all, at the end of the day, devalue, 
whatever the item is that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in this case, it's about terminology. Now, can you say that you depreciate land? You can, but that the proper terminology, like I mentioned, is depletion. Now, if you are looking at it in terms of uh, property management or uh, uh, real estate, right? Of course, right. you would use depreciation or appreciation, right? You always, uh, if you buy a home, usually land appreciates, right? It goes right. up in value because of the, the worth of the land, but you have to pay the property on it. So remember, that's why I mentioned this from the very beginning. You have to treat accounting completely separate from real estate accounting because that one is a completely whole nother uh, bucket of worms. It's much more complicated. It's not the same thing because in this case, we're not adding value to my land. We can't in terms of, um, in terms of adding value, right? You can't, you can't add invisible money. That doesn't work in the accounting equation. So we have to understand that as well, too. We have to treat equity as something different because we know that if my land increases in value, that means I have equity. No, not in accounting. You never, ever add a gain. You can't, you can't create invisible money out of nowhere. So that's the idea here is that accounting you have to stick to your actual accounting equation. Your assets equal your liabilities plus your equity. You cannot add invisible value for no reason. Okay? So, yes, in this case, you have to make a fine division and separation between property management accounting and equity and appreciating versus accounting. Because in this case, we don't, we don't appreciate land. I don't mean it like that. You know, appreciate meanings. We don't add value to the land. Okay. All right. So just making sure that you are aware that land can never be depreciated because there's a different terminology for it. It's called depletion. But again, this is more advanced um, accounting because you have to go into depth and detail of why it becomes depleted. Okay. All right. So let's talk about how depreciation and gap work. So as I've mentioned this a couple of times, right? Historical cost principle is what's going to govern this primarily, okay? There's two rules. So in this case, historical cost is going to be, again, the idea where when you acquire fixed assets, right? You have to record it at fair market value the day that you buy it. Right. So, for instance, I buy a fifty thousand dollar machine. It's going to go in my books as fifty thousand dollars. Right. And over time, if that machine loses value over time, maybe let's say, example, five years later in my books, it's going to stay fifty thousand dollars in my books because of this idea of historical cost. Right. You can't. Lose, you can't lose value over a a fixed asset, right? You can't if you if you can't add invisible money, you can't subtract invisible money either. So we have to understand that. However, to because of depreciation, and we know the reality of of how um, fixed assets work, right? They do lose value over time, right? Maybe there's a new uh, model of that machine that came out with better technology, right? Because we talked about the lower cost of market. Technology plays a huge factor in this. What if there's a machine that operates much better? The, the materials that are made are much better and cheaper and better quality. Even though if that's the case, you still bought it at fair market value the day that you bought it. So it's still going to retain as $50,000 until the day that you sell it. Then it will you will either recognize a gain or loss. Okay? But because of that idea, what depreciation does is it allows you to go into the matching principle where 
you need to match. If you purchase your fixed asset at $50,000, then at the end of the estimated useful life, you need to depreciate it for $50,000. Depreciation is considered an expense, okay? Because you're using the asset, right? We talked about what expenses mean. It means you either get to, you either use something, you get rid of something, or you spend something uh, in order to operate the business. Now, in this case, right, am I actually spending money to depreciate my fixed asset? No. No. Why do you need to put out more money for you to depreciate and lose a value for a fixed asset? No. In this case, what you're doing is um, you bought the fixed asset, right? And you're going to basically transfer certain amounts out from the fixed asset into another account, but not really. On um, In this case, uh, we'll talk about what you have to do when you make those adjustments. But in this case, you have to use the matching principle because whatever you purchased it for should equal the total value of what your uh, depreciation should match the total number of what you originally uh, recorded it in your books as. Okay, so if I spent fifty thousand dollars, that means if if my assets five can be up to five years old, then I have to also be able to depreciate my fixed asset by fifty thousand dollars. So in this case, I'm not. I only spent one portion of the money to purchase the item, but in this case, I don't pay to. Uh, depreciate it, right? I, I'm transferring the money in another way to match um, my uh, total that I started out with with the total that I'm going to depreciate the value by, okay? So those are the two main concepts there for GAAP, okay? So let's actually go ahead and dive into the, uh, the, the components of depreciation because you need to know these five exact components before you can even start depreciating your fixed assets, right? Number one is going to be your cost of the asset. Second is going to be determining the estimated useful life, or in this case, there's also the estimated, um, the estimated uh, units of production, okay? Or in this case, how many units that a machine can produce. Uh, third is going to be determining salvage value and or residual value. So residual and salvage value are um, interchangeable. Okay, so they mean the same thing. It does the I does the asset have value after you've completely depreciated? It, okay, because it's true you can have value after you completely exhausted its life. And then uh, th uh, fourth is going to be date of when you put your um, asset into service. And then, of course, last but not least, determining the depreciation method. Okay. So today we're going to be looking at units of production. So we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at what the depreciation methods are as soon as we go through all five concepts. Okay. So starting with the very first one, cost of the asset. Okay. Now, before we can start depreciating, we have to have this type of idea. What is the value of my fixed asset to begin with? Well, it's going to be every single cost. It takes you not only to get it into store, but has to be ready for service. Okay? So that means those, that means those costs that can include is going to be Obviously, your selling your selling price, right? What did you purchase it for? Okay, you are required by law to be charged sales tax unless you live in a unless you live in a um, state that doesn't charge sales tax. There's there's um, eight states that don't do it, but however, we live in the state of Nevada that does charge sales tax, and even if you transport it from another state, you are subject to pay sales tax. Okay, because number one. You're not purchasing inventory. You're purchasing a fixed asset, okay? Inventory, you can, uh, what do you call it? Um, tax exempt it because you're going to end up collecting the sales tax 
on it anyways. In this case, you're not using these fixed assets to sell, right? You're using this fixed assets to help you either produce or operate your business. So in this case, you are subject to sales tax no matter what given point you are in um, when you purchase your items, right? Second thing is going to be anything that such as shipping and handling, okay? Product fees, okay? So again, shipping and handling, freight, um, things such as if you need to install it, those are going to be considered part of the cost because once you get the, uh, the item, right, and you can't use it right away and you need some installation, well, yeah, then you're going to need to install it and in anything that has to do with anything that gets the asset ready for the store is going to be included in the price. So in this case, if you need to install it, whether it's on, uh, um, whether it's in your store and you need to um, holster it up or something like that, you need to include those costs included as part of the asset, okay? Because the idea is all costs it takes to get the asset ready for service, okay? So that's going to be all included. So if there's, um, if there's training fees, yes, you have to include that. If you have to train somebody to be able to use and operate the machine, yes, that's going to be included as well, okay? So, all right, so those are all the costs that it takes to get the asset ready for service. So here's the second one that we're going to talk about. Now, in this case, it's split into two because I have to explain this because um, as a sole proprietor or a small business, you actually get a little leeway to this exact concept. So I'm mixing up two and three here. The estimated useful life as well as salvage value, okay? So if you're any type of business, whether you're a corporation you are in you are obligated to follow the rules uh, and guidelines of gap and the irs okay and this one is going to determine for you the estimated useful life as well as the salvage value so let's talk about one concept at a time so let's talk about the estimated useful life now we have to understand right when we buy equipment or some kind of fixed asset we know especially with technology we know that nothing lasts forever okay we have to understand that all assets that we purchase has some kind of life to it okay now what do you mean by life right so of course especially with technology right you can't expect a machine to fully operate after it's been X amount of years, right? Because the more that you use the equipment, the more the wear and tear, and eventually your machine or your equipment eventually gives out on you, right? You have to replace the metal parts. Maybe the hinges are bad. It's being rusted. There are many reasons why a certain asset's going to establish some kind of life, okay? Because, again, and we'll talk about what it means when you use your assets so much, okay? Now, when we talk about an estimated useful life, for instance, right, if you're looking at a corporation that buys a big, huge laser ink jet printer, right, the one that makes a bunch of copies on the daily. Think about it. If a corporation buys that, they're probably printing at least a thousand pages per day. Now think about it. If that is going to go through and printing at least a thousand, a thousand pages per day, think about the machine. What happens when you print too much? Paper jams. The wheels start to not turn anymore. You might need to oil it up. You might need to open it up and get the paper out of there. What happens when you put too much uh, paper in the feeder? Things happen, especially with those kind of equipment, right? 
And you can't expect that because you have that machine plugged in your office 24-7 a day. What do you think about that machine? It's going to have a lifespan, right? Especially things that get plugged into a, a electronic, a, a, an electrical outlet, right? Because things are going in through the electrical plug, what happens? It's a computer system, right? That is what I mean, is that especially technology, right? That machine's not going to last you. It will break down quickly. So that is exactly how we determine an estimated useful life is that, well, this product should at least last you X amount of years. So that is exactly where we have to look into GAP and IRS. The government already determines your estimated useful life. Okay? So in this case, they have something similar to a Blue Kelly book, right? You guys know what Blue Kelly book is for cars, right? It gives you the value of your car after you used it. How many miles have you driven it? It's a Blue Kelly book, right? We know what that is. It's a book that determines the value of your car. So this is very similar to that idea where you can look up your fixed asset and determine what the life is and what the value of this it is. So in this case, um, they do have a book like that. And the rule is it's um, five, five, seven, nine, and 11. Okay. But in this case, we won't talk about nine and 11. Uh, just because those are for buildings and for anything that has, um, like, land. We don't care about that. Anyway, so we're going to focus on mostly 5 and 7 because 5 and 7 are going to be the more common assets that you do normally see. So, for instance, anything that is typically a, like, uh, machine or, uh, yeah, anything that's, like, typically that has some kind of tech te technology in it, those things can last you at least five years, okay? So again, um, looking at um, um, the computers, right? You go to the library. They're not going to be always updated to the latest and greatest because the idea is that this computer can last me at least five years, give or take, depending on who's using it, right? So that's the idea here where They've already determined that for you. So anything that's electronics, usually give or take five years, is about the maximum that it can give a life for. Anything other than that, such as machinery, so the big, huge machines, okay? Trucks even. Furniture usually has a, a, a estimated useful life of seven years, okay? Now again... Um, these are already predetermined. Now, again, uh, we won't be using this Blue Kelly book because, again, we're a sole proprietor. Now, as a sole proprietor, we get leeway. So in this case, um, for anything that's other, right? So, again, think about a corporation. If a corporation owns a printer or a copy machine, right, that is what I mean by it's not going to last them for seven years. It's going to last them at least a maximum of five years because the amount of how much they use it, right? But on our side, as a sole proprietor, we don't use our fixed assets as crazy as corporations do. We don't run it to the ground. So that's why the idea of this concept is that as a sole proprietor, we don't have to follow the book, the rules and guidelines that um, that GAP and the IRS has already um, determined for us. We get to determine what our estimated useful life is on our own terms. Okay, we'll talk more into that in a second. So that is um, the first one is S determining the estimated useful life. Okay. How long will the asset last me? Okay. And then, of course, the second one is the uh, salvage value. Okay. Salvage value, especially when you're dealing with a corporation. You have to understand because of the mass usage 
of, of how corporations use their fixed assets, you're essentially going to be using it and running it into the ground. Okay, meaning you're going to maximize the usage of your fixed asset and it's not going to hold a value at the end of its life. So that is exactly why for any other businesses, salvage value, there is no salvage value at the end of its life. Okay, because the idea is for those kind of corporations, they will run the machine down to the ground until it breaks completely off. And once it breaks, it has no value after it, okay? So then we're looking at that kind of idea, right? Where, again, as a sole proprietor, because we don't use our fixed assets as much or as frequent as a corporation would, we also, on our end, get the leniency to have a salvage value, okay? So that's why it's very important that you do know this because, right, we are not using our fixed assets as much as a corporation would. We will have at least some kind of value that is determined at the end of its life, okay? So let's go ahead and, and talk about this. So as for, for estimated useful life, right, we get to determine this now. We don't just go ahead and just make up a number, right? This does include research and it does include a lot of um a lot of time to be able to create this because we have to think about it. How often would we actually use our fixed asset? Okay? So for instance, right? Um you buy a printer, a nice small office jet printer. And you're only printing maybe one or two pages per week. Per week. Now, if you're only turning on the machine every once in a while, how long do you think that asset's going to last you? It could probably last you 10 years. Right? Now, in this case, this is also, it's also predetermined by oh, looking at your, um, your box. Right, because it is a requirement that um, it is by law that every single m equipment machinery is written on their label on what the estimated useful life is. So in this case, the research is also done for you as well. It will tell you on the actual box, I don't know if you know this, in the small print, it will tell you how long this asset should last you before or it needs maintenance. So in this case, some, some uh, printers will tell you that this should print up X amount of pages, right? That's how you know what the life is going to be is, okay, I can only print this many pages, okay, for its entire life of the asset. So that's how you're going to also determine there is there's your research there is by looking on the box itself by the manufacturing because it's a requirement that it is released so people know, right, that the estimated useful life is already predetermined. Okay, so again, like I mentioned, if I buy an, a, 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 an office jet printer and I'm only use I'm only printing maybe one or two pages every week, how long do you think it's going to last me? So I said easily 10 years. Okay. All right. And then, of course, salvage value. So let's take a truck, for instance, right? If I buy a car, I know that I'm going to drive it from here to there. But I'm not going to run it to the ground like a corporation would. I wouldn't be traveling from state to state or going anywhere too far, right? I only need to use my truck for driving to work and driving to wherever location I need to be at. So think about it. I'm not going to be using as many miles. So in that case, right, as we all know, this is why I was talking about the Blue Kelly book. If you're going to buy a truck, we, ha we, we already determined it because we're not going to be running it to the ground, we're not going to be driving it as much as a corporation would, that means at the end of its life, give or take, 
it should hold some kind of valid value, salvage value that I can ultimately um, either sell it to somebody and get some money out of it. And that's the idea that sole proprietors get leniency for. So in this case, if I buy a truck, right, and I only drive it from here to there to Vegas, most most likely go to Reno or maybe, you know, go to North Las Vegas, that's as far as I will drive. So in this case, my car can easily last me 10, 15 years. And I know at the end of its value, it should hold at least some kind of junk, um, junk, junk change, right? So that's the idea here that when we determine our estimated useful life or our salvage value, um, this, is the, this is how we determine it. Now, can you use the Blue Kelly book for the IRS? Yes, you can. If it's something that you're just too lazy to calculate on your own, of course, you're more than welcome to go ahead and utilize what's already provided because IRS will like it if you use their numbers. Right? So they don't have to be on your butt to calculate it for you because you're using their books to let you predetermine everything for you. Okay, so in this case, sole proprietors doesn't have to necessarily do the calculation and determine the estimated useful life. They can go ahead and utilize what's already given, okay? And same thing with salvage value. If they want to treat that their salvage value holds no value at the end of its life, they're, they're more than welcome to do so, okay? But what I'm trying to say here is that as a sole proprietor, you do get leniency for this, and that way you don't overstate your assets because of this right here, because you can get away with it. Instead of completely zeroing out your your assets for no reason, right? And again, especially if you think that it can last you for a long time, then that's exactly what you're going to be doing, okay? Any questions so far? No, good. Okay. So, fourth concept is going to be looking at the date that you placed it into service, okay? So, when we talk about putting um, our assets into service, right? So, we know that if we've determined the estimated useful life, the date that we place it into service is going to be crucial, okay? Why? In this case, when we buy our fixed assets and we place into service, we treat our assets like they age with time, all right? In terms of, yes, if I acquire a fixed asset, I treat it like I treat my baby, right? The day that it was born is going to determine the day that I actually start depreciating my fixed asset, okay? So, for instance, if I decided to buy a fixed asset as of September 1st, okay, since I have it for September, that means I'm going to start depreciating it as of September 1st, okay, because even though my fixed asset has, I don't know, let's say five years on it, right, that means one whole year is going to be from September of this year all the way to September of the next year. You treat your fixed assets exactly like you treat your children. When they age, is exactly how you age your fixed asset. You don't say, I put it into service at sept in September and I'm going to depreciate it for a whole year. No, because no, you did not use your fixed asset for a whole year. You only use it for September, October, November, and December. You only use it for four months. So we have to keep that in mind. Okay? Now, here is also another rule that you have to determine as well. If you purchase it and put it into service, okay, the day that you purchase it and your the day that you place it into service are two different dates. They are usually not going to be the same. But if it's an electronic like that only requires you to just plug into the wall, the day that you purchase it is going to be the day that you put into service, right? Because all you have to do is just plug it into the wall. No, nothing needs to be, it's already ready for service, okay? 
that is also going to be determined based on the date that you have purchased it. So in this case, if you purchased it, if you put into service between the 1st and the 15th, you used it for more than 50% of the month. That means you are going to depreciate that month. Okay? If you purchased it between the 16th and the last day of the month, so whether it's the 30th or 31st, that is less than 50% of the month. So therefore, you don't count that month. You're going to treat it as you're going to treat it as you acquired it, but you're not going to depreciate it yet. You're going to depreciate the following month. Okay? So, for instance, if I decide to buy um, a machine on the December 28th, I only used it for three days. Is that going to be enough for me to depreciate it for the month of December? No, I only used it for three days, which is less than 50% of the month. So, in this case, did I even use it for that month? I barely used it for that month. So that is exactly why you would just push it off and say, well, I will treat it like I, um, I will start depreciating it as of January 1st because that three days will not make a difference. Okay? So that's how the idea here is that we need to determine that. Okay? So, um, okay? so we have to know this because there are possibilities where we can... Uh, depreciate our fixed assets at the end of the year where partial years is going to come into play, right? Because you have a couple things that you should know because it is an adjustment entry. So you have to do it at the end of the accounting period. Now, would it make sense for you to do it at the end of every month? Yes, you can. But most cases, you're more likely to adjust at the end of the year. Okay? So, okay. And then last but not least, component number five is going to be the different types of depreciation methods that do exist. So there's a bunch of methods in here. I will not have time to look through every single one of them, but I do want you to know they do exist. Okay, I'm only going to teach you three depreciation methods because in this class, we are also going to be looking at uh, amortization, and so on and so forth, right? There's uh, These three are the more commonly used ones, especially for corporations and, you know, typical businesses, right? So these three concepts that I've highlighted here are the most common ones, okay? Some of yours is not as commonly used. Um, again, group okay, are not as commonly used. So again, um, let's talk about each and every single individual one. So again, we're going to talk about uh, Excel. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, we're not going to activity based, which is also known as units of production. So that's the first one we're going to take a look at today. We're going to look at um, straight line, which is going to be um, pretty straightforward in this case where you're going to be um, you're going to be depreciating it evenly throughout its course of life and then of course we're going to talk about accelerated which is also known as double declining okay so um, those are the three methods that we're going to take a look at in this class okay so let's go ahead and start with the very first one which is going to be called units of production or activity-based methods, okay? So is everybody okay with the five components that I just talked about? Yes. Okay. So let's go ahead and talk about activity-based or also known as units of production, okay? So the idea here is that when we are going to depreciate these types of assets, right, we have to know that if it's a machinery or some kind of equipment, right, we know that it's going to have a maximum amount that it can produce, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to have a capacity, okay? Once it goes beyond its capacity, what happens? 
There's where you need to go main, main, do some maintenance for it. Maybe you not, might need to replace some of the parts. You might have to, um, maybe you might need to fix it. Okay, so at this point, it's basically what it's determining for you is that there is a capacity, a limit that this, that this machine can produce. Hence the word units of production, right? So what we talk about when we're looking at units of production is if this machine has a capacity or a limit of how many units that it can produce, right? That's going to determine how long this asset's going to last me, okay? So that is something that we have to need to know. And what we're going to do is we're going to spread it across our, the, the cost, right? We're going to depreciate it based on how many units it can produce, okay? So that's activity-based or units of production. So what are the, the, what are the formulas that you will be needing to know, okay? Number one is going to be the depreciation basis, which is going to be the cost of the asset minus salvage value, okay? Then the second thing is going to be the per unit rate, which is going to be your depreciation basis divided by the total number of units that that machine can produce overall, okay? So what, what the capacity is, all right? And then your depreciation expense is going to be your per unit rate multiplied by the number of units it produces that year, okay? And then yeah, the accumulated is going to be your previous year's accumulated depreciation plus the current year's depreciation expense. And then last but not least, book value is going to be determined by your asset cost minus your accumulated depreciation, right? So let's go ahead and take these formulas and let's apply them to this concept here. So um, example number one, okay? We're going to record the depreciation for the first year, okay? There was 2,100 units produced that first year. So in this case, you have a machine, okay? You bought a machine. It cost you a total of $15,000. Its salvage value is $2,500. Its estimated useful life is five years. The total number that this machine can produce is 10,000 units. And again, the date that you put it into service is January 1st. So keep it very sweet and simple, okay? So I was given... And I was told that by the end of this year, I, since I put it into service as of January 1st, it's determined that I produced a total of 2,100 units for this year. Okay? So let's go through the formulas. Number one, you're going to be needed to determine the depreciation basis. Okay? Depreciation basis is going to be your asset cost minus salvage value. So if my asset cost me $15,000 and I have a salvage value of $2,500, simple math, right? That means my depreciation base is going to be $12,500, okay? This amount here, what is a depreciation basis? Your depreciation basis is going to tell you how much you can depreciate your fixed asset for, okay? What does that mean? Well, we'll we'll wait and see when we reach the end of its life, okay? This is the total amount that you can depreciate your fixed asset for, okay? It's $12,500, okay? So then let's determine the rate. Rate is going to be your depreciation basis divided by the total number that the machine can produce. So in this case, $12,500 or 12,500, excuse me, divided by 10,000 units. So therefore, it's going to be determined that every unit that I produce is going to cost me $1.25. 
So we have to think of it that way, right? Your per unit rate is going to determine that every unit that you produce, how much is it going to cost you? In this case, a dollar and 25 cents, right? 12,500 divided by 10,000 is going to give you a dollar and 25 cents, okay? So then now I need to determine the depreciation expense. Well, it's my per unit rate times the number of units that you produced that year. So in this case, I produce a total of 2,100 units. Well, 2,100 times $1.25, right? Because that's how much it's going to cost me for every unit I produce, right? That's going to be equal to $2,625, right? I take my 2100 multiply by $1.25, that's going to give me $2,625, okay? And then now I'm going to go ahead and determine the rest. So right now I need to know what my accumulated depreciation is. Well, in this case, if you're starting out as of the first year that you're depreciating it, right, you don't have any previous year's accumulated depreciation because you're starting from the very first one. So in this case, that's going to be an automatic zero plus your current year's depreciation expense, which in this case I determined was $2,625, right? So that's going to be $2,625. Now I need to determine what is the value. What's my book value, okay? What is book value? Book value is going to tell you what the value of your fixed assets at its current position. So in this case, if I used my machine to produce 2,100 units, it cost me $2,625. So therefore, how do I determine what my value is now? Well, that's what book value is. Book value is going to take the cost of your assets minus the accumulated depreciation, which in this case is going to give you 12375 So that is my current value of my fixed asset. Okay? All right? So far, so good? Got it. Okay? Now, here's a full few rules and regulations because when we journalize this, right, your book is not going to reflect 12375 okay? This isn't, you're not going to take this out of your fixed asset because of the historical cost. So we'll, we'll talk about um, journalizing in a few minutes here, okay? So in this case, that is if I decide to sell my fixed asset, right? Right now, it's only worth $12,375, okay? After using it for one whole year. So let's determine second year. Second year, if I decided to produce 2,000 units, I have to go through everything again, right? Starting with the first one is starting with your depreciation basis. Your depreciation basis, once again, asset cost minus salvage value, so 15,000 minus 2,500, 12,500. My per unit rate still going to be my depreciation basis divided by my total number of units that this machine can produce, which is 12,500 divided by 10,000, I still get $1.25. Here's what's different. Your depreciation expense is going to be different because this year, on the second year, I only produced a total of 2,000 units. So 2,000 multiplied $1.25 is now going to give you 2,500. Okay, so this is where it differs. And then um, you're going to figure out what your accumulated depreciation is. Because if this year, my second year, right, I determined that I'm going to depreciate my asset for $2,500, right? Right now, how much have I accumulated? Okay, so in this case, well, it's my previous years of 2625 plus current year, which is 2500 it's going to give me a grand total of $5,125. And then once again, I'm going to determine the book value of my fixed asset. So in this case, I take my uh, 15000 which is my book value, right? Or which is my, fair, my historical cost. 
minus the 5,125, which is the total amount that I've depreciated so far. And that's going to give me my 9,875. Uh, 9, so if I go ahead and rinse and repeat that for the, for the next five years, this is what happens, right? Notice this. At the end of the estimated useful life, my total number of units is 10,000, right? My depreciation basis and the rate has stayed the same because of the formula is your is the same. You, you, so that's why once you determine for units of production, you're going to notice that your ba your um, depreciation basis and the rate is going to stay the same. Only difference is your depreciation expense because, again, you have a, a, a variable. You have to know how many units that you produce that year, but you have the per unit rate, which is going to determine how much it's going to cost you for every unit you produce. Therefore, your depreciation expense will, be cha will, will vary, right? And then, of course, you're going to add up all of your um, depreciations. So then you're going to get a total at the end of the fifth year, you're going to get a total of 12500 which I've mentioned to you, right, is going to be determined the total amount that you can depreciate. Why? Because at the end of its estimated useful life, how much should the asset val be valued at? Your book value is now 2500 which equals your salvage value. Okay. All right. Any questions so far? No. Okay. So that's journalized. Uh, that's, uh, excuse me, that's completing the depreciation table. How do I journalize this now? Well, in this case, well, well, well actually, let's, let's take a second. We'll talk about journalizing in a second. But in this case, right? So that's what happens when you reach the fifth year. Now, what happens if your fifth year, you didn't produce that 2,000 units? You end up producing 2,200, right? Because many things can happen, right? Your machine can end up producing extra units. Now, if you know that on the box it says that you can produce up to 10,000 units, what happens when you actually end up producing extra at the end of its very estimated useful life? What happens? Is it a possibility of the uh, book value being a little bit more at the end? Um, we can talk about that later, but I'm talking about if, if it's at the end of its life, right, and it's scrambling to produce extra, extra units when it was recommended that it can't go, it can only produce up to 10,000, but you end up pushing out 200 extra units. What happens to those 200 extra units? Is this still accounted for as a unit? Well, technically, yes. But in this case, what happens to those 200 units? Right now, it's reached its capacity. It's already produced over 10,000 units. And because it squeezed out 200 extra units, the likelihood, right, because it's already been five years, it's already worn and torn, right? What is the chances that those 200 extra units could possibly be defective? Very high, right? Because at this point, right, your machine is old. It's it's probably rusted inside. And maybe it did end up producing extra units, but those units are most likely going to be defective because, again, think of it this way, right? You think those units are going to be as good as the units that you produce for the second year? No. No, because of the, the equipment that you're using, right? It's already been worn and torn. The rubber wheat, the rubber bands on it, maybe it's not, maybe they're already starting to tear. There are many reasons that a lot of machines, again, 
in um, that produces products, right? Why is it that we have defective products? It's because of this exact reason. It's because you're producing a product that could be missed, right? Again, mm -hmm. you'll have those possibilities where you'll have you have to test your products, right? So maybe in these two extra hundred units, right? That is exactly what happened. Now, let's go ahead and take a look and just calculate it, right? If for this, if my fifth year, I end up producing 2,200 units, right? Uh, my depreciation basis and rate is going to be the same. My depreciation expense this time is going to be 2,750. And then now my um, depreciate, accumulated depreciation is 12,750. And now my book value has significantly dropped to 2,250. Okay. In this case, another rule of gap is no. If you determine your salvage value already, your book value cannot fall below salvage value. Okay? So in this case, it cannot be less than what it should be at the end of its life. Okay? So therefore, that's why this cannot be true. You cannot fall below salvage value. So therefore, let's take a look at how many units you end up producing. In this case, you end up producing 200 extra units. Now, can you, ac can you account for that? Yes, you can. Or excuse me, can you count that? Yes, you can. But the possibilities of those extra 200 units, right? Likelihood is they're probably either defective. Okay? So, yes, you may squeeze out an extra 200 units, but what is the possibility of those items actually being up to par as what you've already had for the previous years? Most likely, it's, it's most 100% likely going to be um, broken products or defective products. Okay? So, in this case, in your books, no, you cannot record those extra 200 units. But on, uh, uh, or in this case, on your table, you cannot uh, record those extra 200 units. However, in your inventory, if those 200 extra units end up being quality and perfect good units, of course, you can use that as part of your, um, uh, your inventory. But in this case, your depreciation books cannot have those two extra 100 units in there. So in this case, you're going to have to have it at 2000 to make sure that your book value ends up being at salvage value. Okay? All right, so that's just the rule. All right? So how do I actually journalize this transaction? Well, let's see. Now, this is where we're going to be introducing another concept, okay? So at the end of the... Um, first year you already know that when you calculated the depreciation you found out that it was two thousand six hundred and twenty five dollars right in this case we are going to be learning a concept called a contra account called accumulated depreciation right because we talked about this right because of the historical cost right says that if you read if you record your fixed assets it's going to stay in your books as the value that you purchase it that day and you cannot add value to it or decrease the value of it right it must stay in your books as the day that you purchased it for the amount that you purchased it at until the day you sell it okay so in this case my machine is going to be recorded on my books as $15,000 for the next five years until I choose to sell it or get rid of it. So therefore, I need to create a contra account. And that's where I was talking about the contra account is going to be essentially your mean. So in this, remember, what does a contra account do? It decreases the main account, right? So in this case, this contract count called the accumulated depreciation, hence why we have an accumulated depreciation column, right, is our way to rack up and keep track of 
the amount of value that I'm losing in my fixed asset. Okay. And of course, because it's a depreciation expense, right? Because I have to write it off at the end of the year saying that I, yes, I have count, counted for me um, devaluing my, my fixed assets. That is what I have to do. Depreciation expense, and then I have the contra account. This is one directly for the asset that you're um, put it, that you're decreasing, right? But not actually decreasing the value of the asset, right? The contra account just decreases it by nature, okay? So therefore, it's going to be for the twenty six uh, twenty five dollars, okay? Any questions here? So what is it going to look like for the second year? Well, we already determined it, right? The second year, it was 2,500. So that's the same thing. I'm going to depreciate my expense for the 2,500. And the accumulated depreciation is going to be 2,500, okay? Now, why is it my accumulated depreciation 5,125? This right here on your table here is going to be the value that you find in your ledger, okay? Because how many times have I journalized this? Well, I depreciated my first one for twenty six twenty five. Then the second year, I am going to do depreciate. I'm going to put the same account, so therefore, I'm going to add an extra two thousand five hundred in my ledger. Remember. Your ledger holds your account balances. Your journal only records the transaction as it happens. There's no account balance. So in this case, that's what I mean by the, the table that you have here, right, that says accumulated depreciation. This is your ledger account. This is how much should be in your ledger, not your journal. Okay? All right? So... Uh, let's go ahead and talk about partial years and why partial years is important. In this case, right, I mentioned partial years when we determined what the date that we place into service, right? Now, this only applies to concepts where we don't depreciate on the monthly basis. We decide to pre depreciate at the end of the accounting year, okay? So that means we have to wait 12 whole months for us to be able to uh, rack up what we need to rack up and devalue my fixed assets, or in this case, depreciate my fixed assets, right? So if this is the case, we have to determine what that value is, okay? And adjust my, um, adjust my uh, fixed asset accordingly. Right. So in this case, if for this example, I decide to purchase a fixed asset. OK, so in this case, I decided to purchase uh, a machine for ten thousand dollars with an estimated useful life of five years and has a capacity to produce uh, twenty five thousand units. And it has a, a salvage value of two thousand five hundred at the end of its life. OK. If the machine okay, was put into service as of October 18, record the depreciation for the first year, okay? So when, uh, so when um, total units uh, are produced is going to be for the first year was 250 units. So in this case, right, I have all the components I need to know, right? So here's the date that we place in the service. If I am going to depreciate at the end of the accounting year, so I'm assuming my accounting year period for the whole year is January 1st to December 31st, right? How do I depreciate it? Well, if I place into service as of October 18, right? How old is my asset? Remember, we have to determine that my fixed assets are like my babies, right? If I if I if they were born October 18, right? That means I'm going to treat it as if they were born 
November 1st, okay? Because it's less than 50% of the month. So therefore, if my, uh, if my asset was placed into service as of October 18, I'm going to say that I'm going to start depreciating as of November 1st. And if I'm going to depreciate the end of the year, my asset only was used for November right? Because November 1st to November 30th is one month. Then December 1st to December 31st is the second month. So in this case, my value can only be um, calculated up to two months, okay? So in this case, what happens when it's two months old? Well, here's the trick. This actually doesn't take into effect. Why? Because at the end of, or at the end of the year, it's already predetermined that you produce 250 units that year. Okay? So in this case, even if I do my depreciation and stuff like that for that very first year, it's going to be the same exact numbers that you're going to calculate just regularly, okay? Because in this case, it's not based on time. Even though it says that my asset can be, can be used for five years, right? We're determining it based on how many units it can produce. So once my machine is able to produce 25,000 units, I don't care how old my asset is. It has to reach this, this capacity of 25,000 units. And that's what I mean, because think about it. If you, think, if you divide it, right? If it's supposed to be for one whole year, 25,000, if you roughly divide that amongst its estimated useful life, you should be producing 5,000 units per year. But in this case, why is it my first year I'm only producing 250? Because I placed it into service as of October 18. That means I only was using the machine for two whole months. So in this case, it's already predetermined to me, right? This number comes from your... Uh, productions manager, right? You don't come up with this number, okay? Someone told me that you produced 250 units for the first year. So in this case, right, we know that the per unit, the, the per unit rate is going to be based on how many units that you produce. So I mean that year, because you only produce 250 units, when supposedly you're supposed to have roughly 5,000 for the whole year, your asset's only two months old. So therefore, this is where this is where you're gonna determine that it's gonna be seven thousand seventy five seventy five dollars for the first year. Okay. Now we have to understand units of production is not time sensitive, meaning we're not relying on how long the assets can last me. We are determined based on the number of units it produced. So hence the word, units of production, right? Because we don't care about how long this asset can last me. We care about producing up to this capacity of 25,000 units. Why am I talking about it now? Because it will be very relevant when we dive into the other two methods who are heavily influenced by the length of time, okay? Right? Then you're going to journalize it, and that is it for chapter 11.1 for units of produ production. So in this case, this is what we learned in class, right? We learned about the five components that are introduced to depreciation. We learned that if it's determined by um, partial years, it's going to be based on exactly the month that you place into service. Okay, so it's if it's between the first fifteen days, you're gonna depreciate that month because it's more it's more than fifty percent of the month used, and then if not, then it's gonna be less than fifty percent. So um, it's going to be um, depreciated as of the next month. Okay, then we talked about um, estimated useful life. So again, gap determines five, seven, nine, eleven, but in this case, five or seven years, and has no salvage value. But again. As a sole proprietor, you are able to determine your own estimated useful life as well as your own salvage value. Down below, we talked about 
um, how the how to journalize it. At the, we know that this is true. It's an adjustment entry, okay? It only happens at the end of a given accounting period. So whether you do it at the end of the month or whether you do it at the end of the year will be determined because it is an adjustment entry, okay? And here's the formula to calculate your units of production. And once again, it's not based on time. It's based on a capacity, based on the number of units that it can produce, okay? So any questions in regards to chapter 11.1?